Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the complications that can arise during the venipuncture procedure. All right, let's get started. There are complications that can occur during routine venipuncture procedures. And these complications can happen at any part of the process, from the ordering of testing all the way through the collection of the blood for those tests. Errors on the requisition forms may occur. Uh, the requisition form may uh, not have the correct patient information on it or may not be signed by the ordering physician, etc. cetera. Uh, there may be issues with the patient's identification. There can be patients in the emergency room that are not identified and have temporary identification, uh, a temporary identification armband. Uh, patient identification errors can lead to transfusion reactions, uh, the patient been, being given the wrong medication, or of course the misdiagnosis of the patient. Uh, the patient may not have an available area in which to draw blood. Uh, patients in the emergency room, the ICU, which is the intensive care unit, or those who have substantial injuries may not have a good site access for collection. So there are a lot of situations that may complicate the venipuncture procedure. So it's important as phlebotomists to understand what issues may occur and also how to mitigate these complications. The emergency department may have different procedures for laboratory orders. Phlebotomists must follow the policies and procedures of the healthcare facility where they are employed. Orders from the emergency department might be written or actually called to the laboratory via telephone. These orders still should have all pertinent information for the proper identification of the patient, so first and last name and date of birth. There may also be complications with greeting the patient. If a patient is asleep, they must be uh, gently awoken. They must be allowed to become oriented and then they must uh, be able to verify their identification before attempting a venipuncture procedure. Blood should not be drawn from a patient who is asleep as this can lead to errors in identity and also a sleeping patient cannot give consent for a venipuncture procedure. A patient who is unconscious should still be greeted the same way as an awake patient. In an unconscious patient situation, nursing staff will be present and can help assist if necessary. Psychiatric patients may be very uncomfortable with the venipuncture procedure. A psychiatric nurse may assist a phlebotomist with psychiatric patients who may be more anxious. Sometimes there will be a doctor, a clergy member, or family members in a patient's room. If a doctor or clergy member is in with the patient, it is advisable for the phlebotomist to leave and return at a later time to collect that patient's blood. The only exception to this is if the order is a STAT order, which means that the sample must be collected immediately. In that case, the phlebotomist must explain the situation to either the clergy member or the physician and proceed to draw the patient's blood. If there are other visitors, like friends or family of the patient, they should be greeted the same way as the patient is. The phlebotomist must give them the option of standing outside of the patient's room for the venipuncture procedure if desired. Patients in the hospital may need to be transported to other areas of the hospital for other testing. Like, so for example, if they're going to go get a CT scan. So they may not always be in their designated room. If a patient is not in their room when they need a blood sample draw, the phlebotomist should contact nursing staff to locate them. Some patients may be in long-term care facilities. So when drawing these patients, the phlebotomist must be sure to check for restrictions with nursing personnel. Some phlebotomists work for home health care agencies, and these home health care agencies require the phlebotomist to travel to the patient's home to collect their blood. In this case, phlebotomists should have their visits scheduled with the patients. Um, they should also request that any pets of the patient be put in another room. And also, the phlebotomist should never enter the home without permission. They must ring the door doorbell or knock on the front door before entering the patient's house. Sometimes phlebotomists will have patients in healthcare facilities that do not have an identification bracelet on. Patients must have this identification bracelet on in order for a phlebotomist to draw them. If the patient's ID ban is not on the patient, the phlebotomist must request that the nursing staff ban the patient before they are drawn. 
hospitals will have procedures for patients who don't have an identification. So an example of this would be if like a person came into the emergency department from a trauma and they were on, uh, they're just unidentified. Nobody knew who they were. The phlebotomist should follow procedures as dictated by the hospital for patients like this. So oftentimes these patients are given like John Doe identifiers. If the patient is a child or is not able to identify themselves, the phlebotomist should ask a parent, family member, or nurse to verify the identification on their uh, bracelet. If the patient does not speak English, the hospital's procedures must be followed to properly identify the patient before their blood is drawn. Oftentimes, hospitals have translators for these types of situations. The pre-analytical or pre-examination phase of laboratory testing includes the collection of blood samples. There are some pre-examination variables that deal with the patient's activities prior to specimen collection. These all can affect the quality of the patient's specimen. These include basal state, diet, posture, exercise, stress, the patient's smoking status, the altitude that the patient lives in, the time of the day that the blood is collected, and the medications, if any, that the patient is currently taking. The basal state is the ideal time to collect blood from a patient. This is early in the morning when the patient has not exercised or eaten. These results can be compared to normal ranges to determine uh, the patient's condition. So let's look at these other pre-examination variables. If the patient is eaten before their blood draw, this can affect their laboratory values for certain tests. An example of this would be a glucose level. Glucose levels will increase in the bloodstream after a patient has eaten. Also, there may be an increase of lipids or fatty compounds present in the blood after eating. This will affect some of the tests in a lipid panel. Because eating before a blood draw, off, uh, draw affects certain tests, a fasting blood sample is usually requested. This usually requires the patient to not eat eight to 12 hours before their sample is collected. Now it is the phlebotomist's responsibility to ensure that their patient has fasted. If they have not fasted, it must be noted on the patient's requisition form. Posture also may affect specimen results. There are some tests that require the patient to be lying down for a period of time before their specimen is collected. Strenuous exercise before a blood draw may also affect laboratory tests. Levels like creatinine and creatinine kinase may be falsely increased after a patient has performed strenuous exercises. Again, this is why a basal state collection is the most preferred. Stress can also increase uh, hormone levels like cortisol and ACTH, which stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone. When babies are crying, their white blood cell count may also uh, raise. As a phlebotomist, it's important to try to calm a scared or apprehensive patient, especially when these levels are being tested. If the patient is a smoker, this can also affect certain laboratory values like glucose, lipid panels, cortisol, and BUN. Patients who live in higher altitudes generally have higher red blood cell counts, as well as increased hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. Red blood cells are responsible for transporting oxygen to the body's tissues. So in higher altitude climates, like in the mountains, uh, more red blood cells are needed to transport the oxygen. The age and gender of the patient can also affect their laboratory values. An example is that most children have a higher white blood cell count than adults do. Also, genetic men tend to have a higher creatinine level than genetic women due to having in general more muscle mass. Normal reference ranges for laboratory values take into account the patient's age and also their genetic sex. During pregnancy, the overall volume of blood is increased. Specifically, it is caused by an increase of the plasma portion of the blood. This creates a dilutional effect. This dilutional effect may lower hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood cell counts in pregnant patients. Some blood levels are affected by the time of day. Diurnal rhythm is a term that describes the normal fluctuation of blood levels at varying times of the day. Because of diurnal rhythm, some blood tests, like cortisol and iron, for example, must be collected at specific parts of the day. These will be called timed draws, so the phlebotomist will be instructed at what time each patient needs their blood drawn for these specific tests. 
Administration of medication before specimen collection may affect test results, either by changing a metabolic process within the patient or by interfering with the test procedure. Injection of radiographic contrast meteor dyes is one example of that. So this is why doctors will ask patients what medications they are taking, even the over-the-counter medications. People who take aspirin or other anticoagulants will take longer to clot, and additional pressure must be applied for a longer amount of time after the collection to stop that patient from, from bleeding. If the patient is excessively nervous but consents to the blood collection, the phlebotomist may need to have assistance holding the arm or distracting the patient during the procedure. Patients who are nervous or have previously fainted should be reclined or lying down during the collection procedure to prevent them from fainting. Fainting is also known as syncope and can happen during phlebotomy procedures. A patient who becomes cold, has clammy skin, who is sweating excessively, hyperventilating, feels lightheaded, feels dizzy, has vertigo, uh, tunnel vision, nausea, or feels warm or cold, uh, may be about to faint. If a patient is experiencing these symptoms, the tourniqueted needle should be removed as soon as possible. If the patient does begin to pass out, then the needle should be removed and the safety device activated. It's important to try to keep the patient from fainting, of course, and if they do faint, it's, a, it's also important to keep them in the chair so they do not fall on the floor. Seizures during phlebotomy procedures are rare, but the phlebotomist must protect the patient from injury as best as possible. Seizures must be reported to the physician and medical personnel must evaluate the patient before they are allowed to leave. Petechiae are pinpoint round spots that appear on the skin resulting from bleeding. If a patient has petechiae in their skin, the phlebotomist may need to apply additional pressure for a longer period of time after the venipuncture procedure to stop the bleeding. If a patient has an allergy, it's important to not use equipment that has this allergen. Latex and iodine are allergens to be concerned about. Most hospitals do not have latex products. Um, if there is latex equipment, the phlebotomist should know what it is and not use it on people with that specific allergy. If a patient feels nauseated, uh, the needle needs to be removed and activating, uh, and the safety device needs to be activated. The phlebotomist should provide the patient with something to vomit in, even if it is just a garbage can. Uh, the phlebotomist needs to be alert to changes in the patient, keep the patient talking, um, and by doing, this, uh, by doing this, you can tell if they are alert. Patients have the right to refuse treatment. Blood should never be collected from somebody who is not willing. If the patient refuses, the phlebotomist should report that the patient declined. The healthcare facility will have a specific policy regarding patient refusal, and this policy should be followed. Sometimes the specimen tube used for collection will, use, will lose vacuum. This can occur from either defective tubes or those that are expired. To help mitigate this, the phlebotomist should have extra tubes handy. It's important that phlebotomists keep their equipment out of reach of their patient. Specifically with psychiatric patients, it's recommended to only bring the necessary equipment into the room to perform the procedure. Um, and of course, this is because there's less chance of the patient being able to grab any of the supplies or equipment to harm themselves or to harm others. If a patient has sensitive skin, the phlebotomist may need to apply the tourniquet over clothing to prevent injury. A blood pressure cuff can also be used when the vein is difficult to find. If the tourniquet is left on longer than one minute, then hemoconcentration and hemolysis can occur to the sample. Hemoconcentration is an increased concentration of blood cells resulting from the loss of fluid to the tissues. Hemoconcentration can also occur if drawing from a sclerosis vein, an edema site, or vigorous fist pumping. Hemolysis is when the red blood cells break open. This causes the serum or plasma to have a red tint to it. Both hemoconcentration and hemolysis should be avoided or the laboratory values on that patient will be incorrect. Sometimes veins are difficult to locate on certain patients. When veins are not easily located, it's important to always check the other arm first before trying the hand. Veins can be enhanced by using massage, gravity, and heat. This can be accomplished by massaging the patient's arm upward, hanging the patient's arm down, 
or also by applying heat to the venipuncture site for up to five minutes before collection. Leg and foot veins can only be used with permission from the patient's physician. The phlebotomist should avoid the following areas for the venipuncture procedure. Above the IV, if the patient has one. So collecting above the IV leads to a contaminated sample and gives erroneous laboratory values. Also, areas where there is a decreased blood flow should be avoided, as well as any area where there is an infection. Occluded or sclerosed veins should also be avoided. Occluded veins are those that are narrow, blocked, or compressed. Sclerosed veins are those that have collapsed and hardened. Phlebotomists should avoid collecting blood from an area with a hematoma, edema, burns, scars, or fresh tattoos. A hematoma is a bad bruise caused by blood uh, collecting under the skin, and edema is swelling due to tiny blood vessels leaking fluid. Because patients with mastectomies uh, have their lymph nodes removed, which is also, a mastectomy is also um, a removal of the breast tissue, but lymph nodes are also removed in it as well. Um, so because of this, applying the tourniquet can cause the patient to develop, to develop lymphedema or an infection. And lymphedema is swelling due to the buildup of lymph fluid. The sample could also be affected by lymphostasis, which is where the tissue becomes swollen due to a block in the flow of lymph fluid. Phlebotomists must use the other arm in patients that have had mastectomies. When a patient is severely obese, it may be more difficult to locate a vein. A syringe is usually the best method for venipuncture procedure on an obese patient as it gives the phlebotomist a little more control. The cephalic vein in the arm is often more prominent in cases like this, so this is a vein that is commonly used for venipuncture procedures in obese patients. If a patient has an IV, the opposite arm must be used for collection. If a phlebotomist collects a sample above the IV, the sample will be falsely diluted with the IV fluid, causing erroneous results. Only nursing staff can, con can collect from a heparin lock. So this is heparin, which is an anticoagulant drug being given through an IV. So a phlebotomist should never touch these. Renal dialysis is used in patients whose kidneys are failing. The kidneys are responsible for filtering the blood. So when they are failing and not working properly, waste and toxins build up in the patient's bloodstream. Dialysis helps to do the work of the kidneys by removing waste products from the blood. Patients who undergo renal dialysis have something called a fistula. And a fistula is created by joining a vein with the artery. It's usually in the arm. And this creates a large blood vessel for dialysis treatment. So phlebotomists must avoid drawing blood from the arm that has the fistula as it can cause an increased risk of bleeding and infection. Usually patients are pretty good about telling phlebotomists when they have one, uh, but if not, these fistulas can be visibly seen by looking at the arm, so they need to be avoided. Um, they they kind of look like a pipe, like under the skin is what they look like. Patients on renal dialysis may also have a temporary venous catheter. This is an actual tube that is inserted into a vein to allow easy access for blood during dialysis treatment. Phlebotomists are not allowed to draw blood from a venous catheter. Only specialized personnel can do this. Isopropyl alcohol is used for cleansing routine venipuncture sites, but must not be used for collecting samples for blood alcohol levels. So obviously it's isopropyl alcohol, and if you're putting alcohol in the skin and you're drawing the blood to test the patient's alcohol, that's going to be uh, negatively impacted by the alcohol that you put on the skin. So it cannot be used for blood alcohol levels. For blood culture samples, a stronger antiseptic is needed uh, than the regular isopropyl alcohol to prevent contamination of skin bacteria into the culture bottles. Chlorhexidine gluconate, povidine, iodine, and benzalkonium chloride can be used for cleansing puncture sites used to draw blood culture bottles. Before using a syringe, the phlebotomist should pull the plunger back and then push it completely back in, otherwise it's too difficult to draw the blood out. A syringe can be used for fragile veins that can't withstand the pressure from the evacuated tube system. A transfer device can be attached to transfer blood to vacuum tubes after the needle is removed. The syringe, needle, and transfer device should be disposed of in the sharps container. 
The winged blood collection set is also known as a butterfly needle. It's inserted at a 10 to 15 degree angle and is ideal for small fragile veins. It can be used with a syringe or an evacuated tube system. The phlebotomist must have a discard tube that can be used to remove the air from the tubing so it doesn't affect the volume in the tube. There are several reasons that a phlebotomist might not get blood when performing a venipuncture. The needle's position may need to be adjusted. If the bevel of the needle is against the vein's wall, blood will not flow into it. The needle should, uh, or I'm sorry, the needle could be too shallow or too deep, and a slight adjustment may start the flow of the blood. A vein may collapse if there is too much pressure from a large gauge, large gauge needle or a larger vacuum tube. Pulling back too hard on a syringe can also collapse a vein. Missing the vein, of course, will cause no blood to be collected as well. If the phlebotomist thinks they are in a vein, a new tube should be tried in case the tube's uh, not getting the blood is faulty. No more than two attempts should be made by the phlebotomist when drawing blood. Uh, this photo on the right-hand side here is from the phlebotomy textbook. Uh, section A in this photo on the right-hand side um, shows a correct insertion. Section B shows the bevel of the needle pressed up against the wall of the vein. Section C shows the needle too deep and against the bottom of the vein. Section D shows the needle rotated, which is more difficult to do because the safety device should be up. Section E shows the needle through the bottom of the vein. Section F shows a hematoma forming, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Both E and D can be corrected by slightly pulling the needle back until blood starts flowing into the needle. When a hematoma starts to form, sometimes it swells up quickly. So when this happens, the tourniquet should be removed, the needle should be removed, and pressure should be applied until the bleeding stops. Trying to find a vein with blind probing, excessive manipulation of the needle, and putting the needle in too far may cause the phlebotomist to hit a patient's nerve, which can cause them pain. Now, this can also happen if the patient moves or jerks or if blood is collected under the wrist. Temporary and even permanent damage to the nerve can be caused by this. The most damaging permanent nerve injury during venipuncture would be the medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve. Uh, symptoms, symptoms of nicking a nerve include sharp pain, an electric shock feeling, or feeling of numbness. If the patient describes any of these symptoms during the procedure, the phlebotomist should immediately end it. A cold ice pack can be given and the situation must be reported. Depending on the healthcare facility's policy, the patient then may need to be medically evaluated. If the blood is collected too frequently, or more than needed, this can cause anemia in some patients. This is called iatrogenic anemia or nosocomial anemia. When a, pre and when a premature infant has a lot of blood collected, they will need blood transfusions to replace the blood that was collected for testing. Infants and critically ill patients need to be monitored for this type of anemia when a lot of blood is being collected from them. Hemolysis is when the red blood cells break open and spill their contents into the serum or plasma. This photo on the right hand slide shows uh, a very hemolyzed specimen, which we would actually call a grossly hemolyzed specimen. The plasma should be straw yellow color. The plasma here is a dark red, and this is caused by the red cells breaking open. So this is usually caused by poor phlebotomy technique and samples that are hemolyzed must be recollected. A phlebotomist can cause a sample to be hemolyzed by too vigorous mixing, so remember that tubes need to be gently inverted. A too small a needle or too large of a tube can also cause hemolysis. If the phlebotomist does not allow the alcohol on the skin to dry after cleansing the site, this can contribute to hemolysis as well. Probing or pulling back on the plunger too quickly can also hemolyze a sample. Now, less likely reasons for hemolysis can be in the processing section of the laboratory. So rimming out clots. Um, so this is like where um, the, the processor will take a stick and uh, into the, the sample and get a clot on it and kind of uh, rotate it and squeeze it out a little bit. That can cause it. Uh, centrifuging the sample at too high of a speed. So every centrifuge in the lab is going to be validated at a certain speed. So you don't want to go any higher than the speed that is, um, is validated for that particular centrifuge. Um, also an unpadded pneumatic tube system can, can cause it. So a lot of tubes are, or I'm sorry, a lot of specimen tubes 
are transported throughout the hospital with the pneumatic tube system and um, that can be really bumpy so if it's unpadded um, some samples can hemolyze. There are also some physiological factors that cause the patient's blood to be hemolyzed internally. So this means that it's hemolyzed inside the body. It's not caused by something like the phlebotomist did. Um, it's hemolyzed inside the body and then therefore will be hemolyzed inside the tube. So these uh, are this is caused by specific types of anemias, certain microorganisms, and certain medications. And also if a patient has any mechanical valve surgically placed in their body, so this can cause the red blood cells to break open. Um, but if a specimen is hemolyzed, the most likely cause is improper phlebotomy techniques. A hematoma is a bad bruise caused from blood collecting and pooling under the skin. A hematoma can form due to keeping the tourniquet on too long. If the patient bends their arm instead of holding pressure after collection, um, the full bottom is probing around for a vein, uh, using too large of a needle, or an arterial puncture. Um, so meaning uh, the full bottom is hits the artery instead of the vein. Older patients are prone to bruising even when the phlebotomy is performed uh, properly. The phlebotomist must always check the identification band or bracelet um, and ask the patient their name and date of birth. The information from the patient must match the requisition form. Portable label printers can print the correct labels. Remember that improper identification can cause the death of a patient. So as phlebotomists, we absolutely need to make sure um, that we are properly identifying the patient. Phlebotomists must always maintain pressure or have a capable patient apply pressure when they label the tubes. If the patient isn't capable, the phlebotomist should apply pressure to the vena puncture site and apply coban, which is a type of wrap. The phlebotomist must be careful uh, to not wrap it too tightly as it can cut off the patient's circulation. Some patients will have a reaction to bandage adhesive. If this is the case, the phlebotomist should use paper tape or coban. Patients who are on blood thinners may bleed into the tissue after their venipuncture procedure. This blood pooling can cause pressure to build into the area. So this is called compartment syndrome, which is painful and can cause permanent injury to the patient. Patients with compartment syndrome require surgery uh, to relieve the pressure on the tissues. So before applying the bandage after a venipuncture procedure, the phlebotomist must check for bleeding and hematomas to help prevent this syndrome from happening. If the blood is bright red or comes significantly quicker than expected during the venipuncture procedure, the phlebotomist may have accidentally done an arterial puncture. So this means that they hit an artery rather than a vein. If this happens, the phlebotomist should discontinue the collection and apply pressure for five to 10 minutes. And then after that five to 10 minute period, they need to apply a pressure bandage. The nursing staff should be notified that an arterial puncture has occurred. When leaving an inpatient's room, the phlebotomist must make sure that they have not left any supplies. They must also make sure that the bed rails are up so the patient does not accidentally fall out of bed. The patient's table should be within reach as well. If the patient asks for food or water, the phlebotomist will need to notify nursing staff so that they can get it for the patient. The phlebotomist should not be doing that for the patient. So there are many reasons that a sample will be rejected. If it is not properly uh, labeled, if the volume of blood is inadequate in the tube, if the blood was collected in the wrong tube type for that specific type of test, um, if the tube um, is hemolyzed, uh, so if the, the blood inside the tube is hemolyzed, um, if there are clots in tubes that are not supposed to be clotted, that will be one. So like for example, a lavender top tube should not be clotted, uh, so if it's clotted, it will be rejected. Um, if the sample is transported at the wrong temperature, uh, if there's no order for that particular patient, uh, contamination, um, so this could be like most likely IV contamination, um, delay in processing, so certain tests need to be run in a certain time frame between um, time between it, the drawing and it being run. So if it's a delay in processing and it's too uh, old of a sample, that will cause it to be rejected as well. So all of these are reasons that a sample may be rejected. If a phlebotomist has drawn a sample that is rejected, it's imperative that they collect the redraw as soon as possible. 
All right, so that concludes this lecture. If you like this video, please hit the like button and remember to subscribe to this channel for more educational laboratory videos. If you have any questions about this lecture, please leave them down in the comments section below.